We're going to start with pediatric nursing interventions and skills, informed consent of mature and emancipated minors. I need a pen or a pencil. Can I borrow something for you? Thank you. Okay, so emancipated minor, this is one who is legally under the age of majority, so they're not 18 yet, but is recognized as having the legal capacity or social status of an adult under uh, circumstances prescribed by state law. You need to know what these conditions are. Pregnancy, marriage, high school graduation, independent living, or military service. They are considered adults to be able to make decisions. Now, here's what you need to know for NCLEX. You see where they say pregnancy? So mom could be 13 years old, right? She can make the decision for the baby, but she still can't make the decision for herself. Does that make sense? So she's pregnant and she's underage. She can make decisions for her child, but she cannot make decisions for herself unless she's married, unless she's in the armed service. You see what I'm saying? Make sure you guys understand this. Do not let that trick you. If she's pregnant, she's underage, she can make decisions for the baby, but she cannot make decisions for herself. All right. Treatment with parental consent. Exceptions to requiring parental consent before treating minor children occur in situations where children need, look at this, <clears throat> urgent medical or surgical treatment and the parent's not readily available to give consent or refuses to give consent. Those are the circumstances. We don't need that parental consent. If we have to do a life-saving measure, if we don't do it, that patient will die. We can do it without that parental consent. If we have to do a life-saving measure and the parents say no, but if we don't do it, that child will die, we can still do it. I'll go to court later. But this is what's known as implied consent, which means that we're assuming that that patient would want to live, okay? Parental refusal to give consent for life-saving treatment or to prevent serious harm can occur and it requires notification to Child Protective Services to render emergency treatment. That needs to be reported. And they give you examples. Make sure you look at the example on your own. Evaluation for child abuse or neglect can occur without parental consent and without notification to the state before evaluation in most states. So if you even suspect abuse, you can report it and get an evaluation done and you don't need the parental consent. Think about it. If we're suspecting that the parents are the ones abusing the child, you think they would give consent? No. So you can, uh, you actually you're a mandated reporter. You have to report your suspicions. We, you do not need consent for that. Adolescent consent and confidentiality. Because adolescents are not yet adults, parents have the right to make most decisions on their behalf and receive information. Adolescents, however, are more likely to seek care in a setting in which they believe their privacy will be maintained. All 50 states have enacted legislation that entitles adolescents to consent to treatment without the parent's knowledge to one or more medically emancipated conditions. You need to know these conditions that if they're an adolescent, they can consent for themselves. What are those conditions? STDs. Mental health services. Substance abuse and addiction. Pregnancy. Contraceptive adv advice. The adolescent, the teenager can get all of these without the parental consent. And this is why in PEDS, I'm not sure where you guys do rotations, but you guys know I'm a pediatric family nurse practitioner, right? So when I see my patients on Fridays, once they have a teen behind it, 13 and higher, right? The patients in the room with mom and dad, you know, I get the history. I go over, you know, the body mass index, all that good stuff. Parents, any questions, no questions, I kick them out. I kick them out so I can have time to talk to that adolescent. What's going on with you? Are you sexually active? And I talk to the adolescent and get information because the more they talk, the more you know what you have to teach them. Or maybe there's some nursing intervention that you have to do. Maybe there's some screenings you have to do. So make sure you know um, these conditions where you don't need the parental consent for the adolescent.
preparing children for procedures, make sure you guys take a look at this box and you know it. Review parent and child's present understanding through open-ended questions. Don't ask them yes or no questions. I say something like, what do you know about X, Y, Z? And let them talk. The more that they talk, you may have thought you were going to start your teaching here. And then the more they talk, you realize they know nothing and you have to start your teaching here or vice versa. Base your teaching on developmental age and existing knowledge. And you can't do that without asking the open-ended questions and listening to what they have to say first, right? Allow for ample discussion to prevent information overload. You don't want to bombard them with information all at once and ensure adequate feedback. After you've done your teaching, you have to say to them, tell me your understanding of what I just taught you and let them repeat it back to you so you can make sure that they understood what you said. Look at this, important. Use concrete, not abstract terms and visual aids to describe a procedure. For example, use a simple line drawing of a boy or girl and mark the body part that will be involved in the procedure. Use non-threatening but realistic models. Emphasize that no other body part will be involved. Avoid words and phrases with dual meanings unless the child understands such words. And they give example of table 39.1. Here's an example um, when NCLEX is uh, asked about this. I don't remember the choices, but I'll tell you what the correct answer because they were asking you which one is the incorrect thing to say to the patient. You don't say to them, for example, if they're going to get an injection, you don't say to the patient, oh, you're going to get a stick in the arm because in their mind, they might be thinking of an actual branch or a stick. Do you understand? Okay. Allow the child to practice procedures that will require cooperation, such as turning, debriefing, coughing, using an incentive spirometer. Be honest with the child about unpleasant aspects of a procedure, but avoid creating undue concern. Make sure you guys uh, take a look at everything else in this box. Page 1048, take a look at table 39.1. Selecting non-threatening words or phrases, words and phrases to avoid, and suggested substitutes. Instead of saying shot, be thing, stick, ding, 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 ding. That's what it shows up on Anklex. Instead of saying that, say something such as medicine under the skin. Hope that will feel like a pinch. So make sure you guys take a look at that box, okay? Next page, page 1050, box 39.1. Play activities for specific procedures. So for fluid intake, you can make ice pops using the child's favorite juice. Now with that one, um, NCLEX has asked questions about this and it's in regards, for example, that that patient has gotten a tonsillectomy, right? You're gonna give them something cold, you're gonna give them an ice pop with their favorite juice, but what juice would you avoid? What would you, what kind of ice pop would you Acidic. not give them? Acidic, okay, yes, but red, yes. Why, because if it's red, you can't tell if it's an ice pop or if they're really bleeding. And of course you wanna say, you're absolutely right, you wanna stay from, away from anything acidic that or that will irritate their throat, like orange juice. But you definitely need nothing red because if that child's bleeding, you need to know, okay? Make a game out of taking a sip when turning the page of a book or in games such as Simon Says. How else can you get them to increase fluid intake? Use crazy straws. You know straws that have like the loops or whatever. How about deep breathing? What are some activities you can teach them to deep breathe? Because remember, after surgery, guys, across the board, it does not matter what type of surgery a patient has. We're always going to be concerned about these three things. You're always going to be concerned about hemorrhaging. You're always going to be concerned about infection. That's why you have that patient um, be grieved because we don't want pneumonia. And we always are going to be concerned about that patient developing a DVT or that DVT moving and going to the lungs and causing a pulmonary embolism. No matter what type of surgery that patient has, you're always going to be concerned with those three things, okay? So anyway, the deep breathing, we want those lungs to expand. We don't want that patient to get pneumonia. What kind of activities? We can teach them to blow bubbles with a bubble blower. That can help them deep breathe. Blow bubbles with a straw. No soap. 
They might accidentally drill, drink the soap. Blow bubble on the pinwheel. That's been seen on XX often. Take a deep breath and blow out the candles. That's been seen as well. So what you teach them is to pretend that it's their birthday and they're blowing out a candle because you want their mouth to make an O like this. So they're breathing out slowly. Range of motion um, and use of extremities. Throwing bean bags, playing Twister game, or Simon Says. You can say Simon Says touch your head. Simon Says touch your legs, and that will actually get them to do range of motion activities. Play pretend or guessing games. Climb wall with fingers like a spider. You teach them to go like this, right? Because that's getting them to move their arms. Encourage them combing their own hair. Because in order to comb your hair, you got to put your arm up, right? And you got to move that arm. That's the range of motion. How about soaps? If the patient has to do soaps. Play with small toys or objects such as cups, soap dishes in the water. Wash dolls or toys. Read to the child during the soaps. For a sip bath, give the child something to listen to, such as music or stories, or look at a view master book. Activities for them to do with injections. Let the child handle the syringe. This has been seen before too. And so with this one, before they get the injection, let them look at the syringe, see what it's gonna look like. Let them handle it, but make sure you take off the needle first, okay? Let them handle the syringe, vial alcohol swab and give an injection to the doll or the stuffed animal. Let them pretend that they're doing it to their toy. What's going to happen to them? It really helps them kind of process what's going to happen. Have the child count to 10 or 15 during the injection. You're getting them to focus on something else. They're starting to count to 15. And by the time they got to three, you already gave them an injection. And they're like, oh, what happened? I didn't even feel it. For ambulation. Give the child something to push. Make sure you know this. Toddlers get push-pull toys. School-age child, they will get a wagon or a doll in a stroller or, or a wheelchair. For the adolescent, decorated IV stand. Why decorated IV stand? Remember for the adolescent, part of the milestone of them figuring out who they are is self-expression. For extending the environment, for example, the patient that's in traction, they can't get out of the bed. They're in traction. What are you going to do? Make the bed into a pirate ship or an airplane. Put up mirrors so the patient can see around the room where they, you know, they can't move, so they might not be able to see behind them. Give them a mirror. Move the bed frequently to the playroom, hallway, or outside. Next page. General principles of family education. You want to establish a rapport with the family. You want them to be comfortable with you, especially the parents, so that they have concerns, they have questions. They can trust you with that information and ask you so you can educate them. Avoid using confusing specialized terms or jargon. I don't know why they put a sign next to this because that's definitely on choice as well. Give me a second, guys. Let me grab a pen. Thank you, Abigail. Stay away from using medical jargon in words that they would not understand. Incorporate teach back strategies. After you've taught, have them do a return demonstration or have them explain to you what you just taught them. Family preparation for procedures, family education for specific procedures is included throughout this unit. General concepts uh, applicable to most family education sessions. What do they include? The name of the procedure, what that patient's going to get done, the purpose of the procedure, why they're doing it, the length of time anticipated to complete the procedure, about how long it takes, anticipated effects, signs of adverse effects, 
assess the family's level of understanding, demonstrate, and have family return demonstration. So let's talk about this. Do not confuse this with informed consent. Let me make this clear because NCLEX has asked about this very often. When it comes to informed <laughs> consent, the doctor is the one, the doctor, the surgeon, they're the one who's responsible for getting that informed consent, actually explaining to the patient the procedure, all of the details of what's going to happen during the procedure. What may happen if they refuse to have the procedure? What may possibly happen during the procedure? All of that the surgeon explains. You as a nurse, you are witnessing that patient, uh, the surgeon explain. You're witnessing that patient say, yes, I understand everything that you said, and I still want this procedure. You witness them sign, and then you sign as a witness, and you put that informed consent in the chart. If the surgeon leaves the room, and this is how they're going to set you up, guys. They're going to set you up so nice, right? The, the, the patient just signed, and the surgeon just got called for an emergency surgery that they have to save somebody's life. So they rush out of the room and they rush out of the room and the patient says to you, you know what? I was just nodding, but I really don't understand. What are you going to do? I don't care how emergent they make that situation seem. You're going to call the surgeon back to come explain. Because guess what? We care about our patient, right? Don't fall for it. You're going to call that surgeon back to explain. Otherwise, the surgery is not going to happen because it was not informed consent. Another example, another um, question you may get, something like they'll give you a situation where the surgeon explains everything. The patient signed, right? Remember, your job is to witness it. So you signed as a witness and then you took it to go put in the chart. And then when you looked in the chart, you saw that that patient got the pre-op medications, including the opioids before they signed the informed consent. What do you do? <laughs> Guess what? That surgery is canceled. You call downstairs to let them, depending on the options you get, sometimes you'll get options to, like you have to call downstairs to say the surgery is canceled, or you call the surgeon to let them know that surgery is canceled, or you call your um, nursing manager to let them know. Whichever that option is that you get, the point is, guess what? No surgery is happening. That um, opioid has to wear off in their system, and you guys have to start over again. Any mind-altering drug, if the patient gets that before the informed consent, it's not informed consent. Are we clear? Because it alters the Exactly, because it alters the patient's mental status. So it can't be informed consent. Are we clear on that? Okay. What's that? All right, let's go to page 1055. Evidence-based practice skin care. You want to keep the skin free of excess moisture. Um, excess moisture, it breaks the skin down, okay? Especially if we're dealing with geriatric patients. We want to keep their skin um, dry but moisturized. And I know that sounds weird, but that's what it is. We don't want any urine or feces on the skin because that's going to irritate the skin. That's going to decrease the skin's integrity and it's going to be a perfect opportunity for pathogens to grow. It's going to be a perfect opportunity for um, maybe the patient to get an ulcer. So we want to stay away from that. We want to uh, keep the skin free of excess moisture such as urine feces, vomitus. All diaper patients should have barrier cream. Why? We need to protect their skin from the urine or from the feces. Use minimum amount of tape and adhesives because every time you take that tape off, there's a chance that you, you may um, open up the skin and the skin can be very sensitive. We don't want to do that. Alternate electrodes, electrodes and probe placement sites and thoroughly assess underlying skin typically every eight to 24 hours. You want to rotate those sites of those electrodes and wherever the electrodes were, look at the skin, make sure it's intact. Use a draw sheet. Use a draw sheet. You don't want to cause friction and shearing of that patient's skin. Use a draw sheet to move child in bed or onto stretcher. Do not drag the child from under the arms. That goes for adults too, guys. You want to position the patient in a neutral position where 
they are straight. They're not flexed. They're not hyperextended. None of the body parts are rotated. You want them in a straight, in a neutral position. Do not massage bony red and prominences. If it's red and non glanceable guess what? You're already at stage one. Why would you massage it? Massaging it is putting more pressure on that area. You're making it worse. Interventions found to prevent pressure ulcers in critically ill children include assessing the patient's skin from head to toe on admission and each shift. We want to make sure, you know, there aren't any reddened areas. We want to make sure we turn the patient every two hours. Why? We want to keep pressure off of just one site for a long time. Use pillows, blanket rolls, and positioning devices. Use draw sheets to minimize shear. Use pressure reduction surfaces such as foam overlays, gel pads, specialty beds, like those air mattresses. Allowing moisture reduction by using dry weave diapers and using disposable underpads. Use skin moisturizers. We want the skin dry, but we want it moisturized because if it's too dry, it's not moisturized, guess what? That's the skin integrity decreases. Conduct nutritional consults. You may ask you, the RN, not the LPN, you, the RN, is responsible for calling the physician and asking for nutritional consult. Oh, thank you. Or to get dietary involved. I keep forgetting to go on airplane mode when I'm teaching. It's all about food. Oh, I know, right? Do not disturb. Yes, you're right. Thank you. You're right. Matthew would have a heart attack. <laughs> have it set that when you call at certain times, you send a message saying, no, you can't have anything to eat. <laughs> Darn. You know, with this new update, I don't even know how to use the do not disturb. Pull down to the top right corner. You said that too. No. Oh, from from. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys, give me two seconds. I'm putting this phone on. Do not disturb. Then we'll continue. Um, to the right. This way or this way? Yeah, 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 yeah right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I learned something new. Don't forget to um, turn it off. All right. <laughs> Something I skipped, guys. I didn't even see it, but post-op care. Make sure you guys look at this box. Okay. Page uh, 1054. Post-op care, okay? I'll go there real quick with you. After surgery, you always want to get a baseline on your patient. Inspect the operative area. If there's a dressing, check that dressing. Because if the patient comes to you and there's just a pin size, you see blood, but it's just pin size on the dressing. And, you know, 10 minutes later, that dressing is soaked. They're bleeding out, right? They're bleeding somewhere. So it's very important. You want to reinforce, but do not move loose dressing. Remember, post-op, when the patient comes from surgery, that first dressing change, who's doing it? The surgeon. Now we know that doesn't happen in real life. But for testing purposes, you better know it's the surgeon. That's who you're going to choose. Assess for compartment syndrome with any restrictive devices. That patient comes back. 
there's a cap their um, interaction, anything that's restricting that area, you better check for compartment syndrome. You better be checking those six Ps, okay? Assess the skin color and characteristics. Assess the level of sedation and activity. You're not going to feed that patient until that gag reflex has returned, right? Right. You're going to check the dressing for bleedings and other abnormalities. You want to check bowel sounds in all four quadrants. Make sure, let me tell you something, you don't hear bowel sounds, you better not give that patient anything to eat either, even if they have a gag reflex. So we want to make sure there are bowel sounds, that there's you know, no um, obstruction going on. Assess for GI, excuse me, assess for bladder distension. Observe them for signs and symptoms of dehydration. And this is a biggie, detect the presence of infection. Because remember, when a patient has a surgery, we're concerned about bleeding, we're concerned about DVT slash pulmonary embolism, and we are concerned about infection. So we're going to be looking for those signs and, signs and symptoms of infection. You're going to take their vital signs every two to four hours in order. Collect or request needed specimens. Inspect the wound for signs of infection, such as redness, swelling, heat, pain, purulent drainage. Okay, now we can move on. Let's go to page 1056. Friction and shear contribute to pressure ulcers, and this is why it's so important to use that draw sheet. Friction occurs when the surface of the skin rubs against another surface, such as bed sheets. It most often occurs over the elbows, heels, or occiput. Bony areas. Prevention of friction injury includes the use of full mattresses that redistribute pressure because that's the problem, guys. Too much pressure on an area for too long. So foam mattresses that redistribute the pressure. Customized splinting or foam padded boots over the heels, that bony prominence. Gel pillows, moisturizing agents, protective transparent barrier dressings over the susceptible areas, and soft, smooth bed linens and clothing. By itself, friction does not cause tissue necrosis, but when it acts with gravity, it results in shear injury. Let's talk about shear. Shear is the result of the force of gravity pushing down on the body and friction of the body against the surface, such as a bed or chair. Prevention of shear injury includes using lift sheets when repositioning the patient, elevating the bed no more than 30 degrees. And the reason for that, guys, the higher you have that head of the bed, they keep what? Sliding down. Elevating the knees to interrupt the pull of gravity on the body towards the foot of the bed. Page 1057, feeding a sick child. Make meal times pleasant. Avoid any procedures immediately before or after eating. If you have an unpleasant, if they have an unpleasant experience right before the meal time, they're not going to want to eat. And nutrition is very important. Doesn't nutrition fall under mas mas uh, uh, physiological integrity in Maslow's hierarchy of need? Yes, it does. So you don't want to do it before because they're not going to eat. And you don't want to do it right after because if they just ate and now they're doing all this crying, guess what they're going to do? throw up. Now we're worried about fluid electrolyte imbalance, right? So you want to avoid any procedures immediately before or after eating. Make certain the child is rested and pain-free. You want to serve small frequent meals rather than three large meals. Provide finger foods to younger children. Involve children in food selection and preparation whenever possible. The more, they'll be more likely to actually eat the food. Provide the food selections that are favorites of most children, such as peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, hot dog, hamburgers, macaroni and cheese, depending on that patient's diagnosis. Provide fluid selections that are favorites of most children, such as fruit punch, cola, ginger ale, sweet tea, et cetera, depending on that patient's diagnosis. Offer nutritious snacks. 
make food attractive and different? What are some examples? Using a cookie cutter to shape the sandwich. Serving fluids through brightly colored or unusually shaped straws, those crazy straws. Slicing the sandwiches into fingers. Cutting apples horizontally to make circles. Praise children for what they do eat. And this is a biggie. Do not punish children for not eating by removing their dessert or putting them to bed. Page 1060, let's talk about toys. <coughs> I think the number one thing parents do, you don't, you don't get dessert. Yep, like, and that's a big no-no. Everyone there? Toys. All objects within reach of children younger than three years old should pass the choke tube test. So what is that? A toilet paper roll is a handy guide. If a toy or object or object fits into the cylinder, items less than one and one fourth inches across or balls less than one and three fourths inches in diameter, it's a potential ch uh, choking danger to the child. So if it can fit through that tube, that of the uh, toilet paper roll, it's not safe. They can choke on it. This is another biggie, guys. Make sure you know it. Latex balloons. Latex balloons pose a serious threat to children of all ages. If the balloon breaks, a child may put a piece of the latex in his or her mouth. If it's aspirated or swallowed, the latex piece is difficult to remove and it will result in choking. Latex balloons should never be permitted in the hospital setting. You see why I tell you do not pay attention to what happens in the real world. The real world and textbooks is different. And for testing purposes, you will get answer choices of what you see in the real world. Go buy your textbook. Never. Page 1061. Talk about preventing falls. Prevention of falls requires alterations in the environment. So what are some alterations? keeping the bed to the lowest position, placing the call bell within reach and teaching that patient, hey, you gotta get up, make sure you press the call button so I can help you. Offer toileting on a regular basis so they don't try to get up by themselves to go to the bathroom. Keep lights on at all times so they can see well. Keep the floor, floor clean and free of clutter. Make sure there's not toys on the floor that they can trip over. Ensure gate belt during ambulation. Patients who've been lying in bed need to get up slowly. Why? We want to avoid orthostatic hypotension. Sitting on the side of the bed before standing, we're going to teach them to dangle. Move slowly, dangle before standing up. Infection control. Standard precautions. Standard precautions involve vigilant hand hygiene, and the use of barrier protection, such as gloves, goggles, gown, or mask to prevent contamination from blood, all body fluids, secretions, and excretions except sweat, regardless of whether they contain visible blood. If it's wet, you're definitely putting on gloves. Others, non-contact skin, mucous membranes. Why? It's still wet. Non-contact skin, is that skin's um, not intact, they can bleed. You may not see it, but they can bleed. Transmission-based precautions. Transmission-based precautions are designed for patients with documented or suspected infection or colonization. Transmission-based precautions, airborne precautions, droplet precautions, contact precautions, all of these are transmission-based precautions. So let's talk about airborne precautions. Airborne precautions reduce the risk of airborne transmission of infectious agents. Airborne transmission occurs by dissemination of either airborne droplet nuclei. And look at this, guys. For airborne, the particles are less than five millimeters. They're very small. 
less than five millimeters of evaporated droplets that may contain, uh, excuse me, may remain suspended in the air for long periods or dust particles containing infectious agents. So they're very small, but they stay suspended in the air, which means that patient could have coughed, right? And they walk, they go on their merry way. It's two hours later and you're walking in the same place that they walk and you breathe in those droplets because they stay suspended in the air for hours. Examples of um, the airborne infection. You better know them, measles. Varicella, that's a big one. And Clex was asked about this very often. And so is tuberculosis. They asked about that one as well. Know those examples. These are airborne um, infectious diseases. Let's talk about droplet precautions. So remember with airborne, they're very small, but they stay suspended in the air for, for a very long time, right? With droplet precautions, these particles are large. They're larger than five millimeters. Droplet precautions reduce the risk of drop, um, reduce the risk of droplet transmission of infectious agents. These are large pro, um, particle droplets, larger than five millimeters. The droplets are generated from the source person primarily during coughing, sneezing, or talking, and during procedures such as suctioning and bronchoscopy. These droplets do not remain suspended in the air, and they generally travel only short distances, usually three feet or less, but up to five feet through the, uh, excuse me, up to 10 feet through the air. Because droplets do not remain suspended in the air, special air handling and ventilation are not required to prevent droplet transmissions like airborne precautions are. Let's talk about contact precautions. Contact precautions reduce the risk of transmission of microorganisms by direct or indirect contact. So direct, such as, you know, um, you shaking someone's hand, and then those pathogens that are on your hand, you touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth. Indirect is that patient that has the infectious agent on their hand. They touch a desk. Now that infectious agent is on the desk, and you come behind them, you touch that desk, and you put that your hand in your mouth or your nose or your eyes, okay? Look at this nursing alert. The most common piece of medical equipment, the stethoscope can be a potent source of harmful microorganisms and nosocomial infections. Why no, remember nosocomial infections, those are infections that the patient gets in the facility. You pass that on. So something I used to do, this was back when I used to work infectious disease and I've seen my patients. Um, guess what? I had a glove over my stethoscope. I sure did. I put a glove over my stethoscope, saw my patient, listened to the lungs, listened to the heart sounds, walked out the room, took that glove off, threw it away, cleaned off my stethoscope, put another glove on to go to the next room. Make sure you clean your stethoscopes when you go room to room. You don't have to be extra like me, but just make sure you clean your stethoscope. Types of precautions and patients requiring them. Box 39.2. Again, airborne precautions. Patients with measles, varicella. That's the one they ask about. They, I see students have said that it's been on NCLEX before. Tuberculosis. Those are airborne. Droplet precautions. Remember droplets, those are the big ones, more than five millimeters, but they don't stay suspended in the air for long, but they can travel up to three feet, maybe even 10. Examples, meningitis. By the way, guys, when we get to meningitis, you'll see this, but let me tell you something. When you suspect a patient has meningitis, has it been confirmed, you just suspect it. Patient comes in, it's an adolescent or young adult, they've got fever, they've got photophobia, they've got nuchal rigidity, all those types of symptoms of a meningitis. Immediately, they're going on drop the precaution, they're going on isolation, okay? You have to protect everybody else from that patient when you even suspect the patient has meningitis. So drop the precaution, meningitis, 
pneumonia, epiglottitis, sepsis, adenovirus, influenza, mumps, rubella, parovirus B19, all of those fall under droplet precautions. Oh, I didn't underline. Also, guys, streptococcal pharyngitis. That falls under a uh, drop of precautions as well. Next, contact precautions. Skin infections that are highly contagious or that may occur on dry skin, and they give you a list of them. Um, I didn't let me look for it. it there we go, impetigo. Make sure you know it's Tigo. Viral or hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. MRSA. Viral hemorrhagic infections. Herpes virus simplex. All of those fall under contact precautions. Let's jump to page 1074. Everyone there? A traumatic care, encouraging the child's acceptance of oral medication. Most kids don't like to take medicine. Give the child a flavored ice pop or small ice cube to suck to numb the tongue before giving them the drug. Mix the drug with a small amount, about 5 ml, of sweet tasting substance, such as flavored uh, syrup, jam, fruit purees, etc. Avoid dairy products with medication administration. Why? Because those dairy products can uh, interfere with absorption of the drug. If nausea is a problem, Give a carbonated beverage poured over finely crushed ice before immediately, before or immediately after the medication. That will help with the nausea. When the medicine has an unpleasant taste, have the child pinch the nose and drink the medicine through a straw. This has been seen on NCLEX. Make sure you know this. Avoid adding a medication to an infant's regular bottle. Because guess what? If that infant doesn't drink the whole bottle, you're in trouble. You don't know how much of that medicine the infant got. As the infant may not drink the entire bottle within the time frame appropriate for one dose of medication. Make sure you know that. Page uh, 1077. Everyone there? All right. I am injection sites in children. Vastus lateralis. Make sure you guys know the location. Palpate to find the greater trochanter and knee joint. Divide vertical distance between these two landmarks into thirds. And then inject into middle third. The needle insertion site, 22 to 25 gauge. Advantages of you using the vastus lateralis location. The muscle there, it's large, it's well-developed. And you guys can give more amount of fluid there because the muscle is larger and well-developed, okay? Larger quantities of fluid, 0 0.5 milliliters to two milliliters of fluid can be injected. Disadvantages, Sciatic nerve damage from long needle injected posterior, uh, posteriorly and medically into small extremity. Remember, guys, um, you hit that sciatic nerve, that nerve is damaged for the rest of their life. Ventral gluteal, make sure you guys know the location of the ventral gluteal site. The needle insertion site you're going to use is 22 to 25 gauge, about half to one inch. Advantage, again, um, you can give larger quantities of fluids, about 0 0.5 to 2 mLs. Deltoid, make sure you know the location of the deltoid. Needle size, 22 to 25 gauge, about half an inch to one inch. 
your needle and advantages, less pain, less pain, fewer local side effects from vaccines compared to the vasus lateralis. The disadvantage, only limited amount of drug can be injected about half to one milliliter. Page 1084, this nursing alert, make sure you know it. One gram of a wet diaper is equal to one milliliters of urine. So if a patient's on strict INOs, you're going to have to measure, be measuring those. Um, you're going to have to weigh those diapers. One gram of a wet diaper is one ml of fluid. Page 1089. This nursing alert, make sure you know it. To reduce unpleasant sensations when administering medications for the eye, you're going to apply a finger pressure to the lacrimal punctum at the inner aspect of the eye. And you're doing that at the inner aspect of the eye, guys. Remember what you guys learned in pharmacology? You want to avoid systemic absorption, right? So make sure you guys do that. So you're going to... Um, Put pressure on the lacrimal punctum of the inner aspect of the eyelid for one minute. How about the ear? For the ear, you're going to allow the medication stored in the refrigerator to warm to room temperature before instilling. If you put that medication cold in the patient's ear, you can cause them to have vertigo, you can cause them to have headache, you can cause them to have pain. Okay, so you're going to warm it to room temperature first. How about the nose? You're going to position the child with the head hyper extended all the way back. Okay, flexion, extension, hyper extension. Hyper extended to prevent strangling sensation caused by the medication tickling into the throat rather than up into the nasal passages. Another nursing alert. If both eye ointment and drops are ordered, so you got to give an eye ointment and you got to give an eye drop, give the drop first. Give drops first, then wait how many minutes? Three minutes. Wait three minutes and then apply the ointment. Drops first, wait three minutes, and then ointment. When possible, administer eye ointment before bedtime or nap time because the child's vision will be temporarily blurred. So we can decrease the risk of falls or injuries. And guys, listen, when you see I'm skipping things, it's not that it's not important. It's important, you guys are responsible to know but you know, I like to give you the meat and, uh, meat and potatoes. All right, take 10 minutes break, and then we will start on the respiratory system. and <laughs> Yeah. Give me one second and I'll talk to you about that. Give me one second. Yeah. The child with respiratory dysfunction. Okay, so let's start with infectious agents. Other agents involved in primary, secondary invasion, uh, group A hemolytic streptococci. You guys are gonna learn a lot about this agent, so let's just get started. Um, where's my, here we go. The infection rate increases from three to six months old, which is the period between the disappearance of the maternal antibodies. So between three and six months, 
Remember, the baby's born with a lot of protection from the mom, right? She has a, the, he or she has a lot of the antibodies for mom. But between three and six months old, they start to lose those antibodies. This is a period between the disappearance of maternal antibodies and the infant's own antibody production. The viral infection rate remains high during the toddler and preschool years. And a lot of that has to do with them going to what? Daycare. By five years old, viral respiratory tract infections are less frequent, but the incidence of mycoplasma pneumonia and GABHS that's your group A beta hemolytic streptococci. I'm not going to keep saying it. So GABHS infections increase. By five, their body has been able to now recognize most of these infections and be able to fight it on their own. Their immune system got stronger, okay, by five. But those two infections that we tend to see as very common is the mycoplasma pneumonia and the GABHS infections. Those increase. The amount of lymphoid tissue increases throughout middle childhood, which is good. That's good for immunity. And repeated exposure to organisms confer increasing immunity as children get older. So as they get older and they're exposed to more of those infections, their immune system gets stronger. Size. Talk about size. The distance between the structures within the tract is shorter in the young child. So it's very easy if they have a cold or a runny nose, whatever that infection was in the nose, to travel to the ear. Now they got an ear infection because those the, the structures are so small and closer together. But as they get older, as they get bigger, the structures get longer, they get farther apart. And so the risk of those infections traveling gets smaller. It makes sense, guys. The distance between structures within the tract is shorter in the young child. Therefore, organisms may move rapidly down the shorter respiratory tract, causing more extensive involvement. Resistance. Deficiencies of the immune system place a child at risk for infection. Other conditions that decrease resistance. What are those conditions? Malnutrition. Vitamin C is helps fight infection. Um, protein's good for infection, right? So if they have malnutrition, that's going to put them at risk for infection. Anemia, fatigue, conditions that weaken defenses of the respiratory tract and predispose children to infection include allergies such as allergic rhinitis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, asthma, history of RSV. That's respiratory cyclical virus. Cardiac anomalies that cause pulmonary congestion. Cystic fibrosis. We're going to go over all of these guys. Daycare attendance and exposure to secondhand smoke increases the likelihood of infection. You need to kill that. Daycare and exposure to secondhand smoke increases likelihood of infection. Seasonal variations. The most common respiratory pathogen appear in epidemics during winter and spring months. That's when we see them the most. Infection-related asthma, such as asthmatic bronchitis, occurs more frequently during cold weather. And that cold has to do with that hyperconstriction of the airways. Winter and spring are typically RSV season. Clinical manifestations. Infants and young children, especially those between six months and three years old, react more severely to acute respiratory tract infections than older children. Nursing care of the child with respiratory tract infections. <laughs> the assessment should include respiratory rate. Respiratory rate should be 12 to 20. Your book says what, 12 to 20 or 12 to 22? Each book's different. Take a look. But the point is, you better be looking at that rate because if the patient's got tachypnea, uh-oh, there's a problem. They've got tachypnea for a reason. Those respirations have increased for a reason. That means they're not having enough perfusion. And so they're trying to get more oxygen in the system. The depth of respirations. Are they using accessory muscles to breathe? 
rhythm, heart rate. The heart rate tells you a lot too. The heart rate increases to try to compensate when the patient's not getting enough oxygen. So the heart rate's gonna increase because it's trying to push out more oxygenated blood to the body. You're gonna look at their O2 stat, the hydration status, the body temperature, their level of consciousness. Patients not getting enough oxygen, one of the first things you're gonna see a change in the level of consciousness because there's not enough oxygen going to their brain. Activity level, level of comfort. Special attention should be given to the observation outlined in the box and the assessment of the following. Respiratory effort, how hard is it for them to breathe? Are they using um, accessory muscles? Are they using retractions? Are they producing nasal flaring? That's a big red flag. Make sure you're looking at their pulse ox. We would love that O2 sat to be 98 to 100, but we'll take 95 or higher, right? Anything lower than 95, we're concerned. The body's temperature. Um, the higher that patient's body temperature, that, in that increases that patient's metabolic rate. Guess what? That increases the need for oxygen. The child's activity level, child's comfort. Take a look at box 40.1. Signs and symptoms associated with respiratory tract infections in infants and small children. Fever. If it's a neonate that's younger than 28 days, we may not see a fever. It doesn't mean they don't have that infection, just fever may not be a clinical manifestation. But otherwise, fever. Fever's greatest at six months to three years old. Temperature 103 to 105, even with mild infections. Those are high temperatures for just a mild infection. Fever is often the first sign of infection. Anorexia, them not wanting to eat. This is common with most childhood illnesses. Frequently, the initial evidence of illness. And so it's not abnormal when, you know, a child was sick, they had an upper respiratory infection. Every time the child comes to the primary care office, they're going to get weighed, right? So they have an upper respiratory infection, they're given whatever the medications are, and then they come back in two weeks or 10 days for a follow-up. It's not abnormal. It's actually very common that when you look, compare the weight, you'll see that they lost a little bit of weight because when they're sick, they don't want to eat. Vomiting, this is common in small children with illnesses and is frequent cause of dehydration. Remember, their bodies are very small, so we are very concerned with fluid and electrolyte imbalance when it comes to small children. We're concerned with vomiting, we're concerned with diarrhea, because that's how they're losing those fluids and electrolytes. Di we also see diarrhea, we see abdominal pain, we see nasal blockage. With the nasal blockage, small passages of the infants are easily blocked. So they become that mouth breathers because they can't breathe through their nose. It can interfere with respiration and feeding the infant. Think about it. These tiny little bodies, the, the, the uh, nasal passages block. So they're mouth breathers and you're trying to feed them. They're getting oxygen through the mouth and you're trying to feed them. Okay. So uh, obviously that can um, interfere with um, respiration and it may contribute to the development of otitis media and sinusitis that's been seen on NCLEX. Make sure you know it. When it comes to nasal blockages, remember those tubes are very short. And so that um, nasal blockage infection that they have can easily travel to the ear. And now that patient has otitis media. Can I take a very quick interruption? Sure. Okay. So you go across the way to speak with Dr. G to ask or are you just taking the practice test tomorrow if we do it for home? Sure. Okay, <laughs> so um, as I was saying, NCLEX, guys, NCLEX has asked about that, so that's important to, for you to know when it comes to nasal blockages, especially in the small children, it could lead to ear infection, okay? Um, other signs and symptoms we see in upper respiratory tract infections, nasal discharge, cough, uh, respiratory sounds such as cough, hoarseness, 
grunting strider <gasps> not good you hear let me tell you something strider is the sound you hear of air trying to get through an obstructed airway okay red flag strider wheezy a patient may have a sore throat they may say it hurts when they swallow they may refuse to eat or drink fluids, obviously, if they have that sore throat. So those are um, signs and symptoms of upper respiratory tract in infants and small children. Ease of respiratory efforts. Page 11, 13. Moisturized air is a common therapeutic measure for symptomatic relief of respiratory discomfort. Moisturized air. The moisture soothes the inflamed membranes and is beneficial when there's hoarseness or laryngeal involvement. Remember the laryngeal voice box? Mist tents have been used in the hospital for humidifying the air and relieving discomfort, but they're seldom used in developing in developed countries. The use of steam vaporizers in the home is often discouraged because the hazards related to the use and limited evidence. Here's why. Hold on, let me underline it, and I'll explain to you guys why I'm this. What's that? Burns, there you go. That's why, burns, that's why we discourage it. A time-honored, but not evidence-based, but it's a time-honored method of producing steam is a shower. So you put the shower all the way on hot, you close the door, and you have the child sit on the toilet and just breathe in um, that, that, that steam. Running a shower of hot water into an empty bathtub or open shower stall with bathroom door closed. A small child may sit on the lap of a parent or older adult. That's been seen on NQUEST. Make sure you know it. The, the principle of this is across the board. When it comes to pediatrics, you always want to make the child as comfortable as possible. And they're going to be comfortable with their parents. So whatever treatment it is you're doing for that child, allow them to sit on the parent's lap or next to the parent if they want to. Don't force them to sit on the exam chair, uh, table. Promote comfort. An infant nasal aspirator or a bulk syringe is helpful in removing nasal secretions before feeding and sleeping. Something important about these guys, they need to be changed often. A couple of years ago, they had um, a study where they cut those syringes. You know those blue syringes? They cut it in half and you should have saw the mold and all the nasty goop that was just sitting there because you don't think about it. You just suck out, you know, the phlegm and that goop and then you, you throw it out and you might rinse it, but you forget all about all that crap that actually sits in there. Okay, so it's a reservoir of bacteria and pathogens. No, Frida. Okay. Yes, the same questions are very helpful as well. So, guys, look. Guys, this practice, in addition to installation of saline nose drops, may clear the passages and promote feeding and rest. Because once that nose is clear, then they'll be breathing through their nose. They won't be mouth breathers and they're more likely to eat. Mm -hmm. To avoid rebound congestion. You guys learned about this last semester. Vasoconstrictive nose drops or sprays should not be administered for more than how many days? Three. What else can we give? Topical vapor rubs. Those vapor rubs should never be given orally or placed beneath the nose. Preventing spread of infection. <laughs> Perform careful hand washing <laughs> when caring for children with respiratory tract infections. <laughs> children and families should use a tissue or their elbow to cover their mouth or nose when they cough or sneeze dispose of the used tissue properly, and then wash their hands. So don't use their hands to cover their mouth. Use a tissue or the elbow. Make sure you throw away that tissue. Don't let the tissues accumulate. 
because that's what kids will do. That's so nasty. Don't let them do that, right? Throw the tissue away, wash hands. Used tissue should be immediately thrown into the waste basket and not allowed to accumulate in the pile. Do not let the patients do that. Children with respiratory tract infections should not share drinking cups, eating utensils, washcloths, or towels. To decrease respiratory virus contamination, make sure you wash hands frequently. Do not touch eyes or nose with the hands. Let's talk about reducing body temperature because remember fever was one of those clinical manifestations you see, right? Nurses should verify that family members have a thermometer and know how to correctly take a child's temperature and read the thermometer accurately. Don't assume that they know. I've had parents that have had thermometers that are just the thermometers that you read from the forehead and they didn't know. They stick it under the tongue or under the armpit. One of the, oh, ding, ding, ding. One of the cardinal signs that the child's feeling better is an increase in activity. They start to eat more, drink more. They start to do more things. They wanna play more. Liquids are encouraged to reduce temperature and minimize its chances of dehydration. When that patient has a fever, you want to make sure you keep them um, hydrated. Look at this nursing alert. Parents are cautioned about over-the-counter cold remedies because these often include acetaminophen. What's acetaminophen? Tylenol. Careful calculation of both the acetaminophen given separately and the acetaminophen in combination uh, medications is necessary to avoid overdose. Because if that kid has a fever and the healthcare provider has ordered acetaminophen five mLs every four hours as needed for temperature 101 or higher, right? They're giving that kid that five mLs of um, the acetaminophen every four hours but now they're giving the kid another cough medicine that's over the counter that also has a cinnamon in it. We need to make sure that we don't give them overdose. Aspirin causes race syndrome. Let's talk about promoting hydration. Infants are especially prone to fluid and electrolyte deficits when they have a respiratory illness because rapid respiratory rate that accompanies, accompanies such illnesses preclude adequate oral fluid intake. Parents are instructed to encourage adequate fluid intake by offering small amounts of favorite fluids. Clear liquids if vomiting at frequent intervals. Why? We want to make sure that there's no bleeding happening. In addition to that, we want to make sure we're not giving them anything that's irritating. Oral rehydration solutions are giving you examples such as Infolite or Pedialyte or beneficial for infants and young children or water or low carb, less than uh, five grams for eight ounces. Flavored drinks are appropriate for older children. Look at this, guys. Look at what you want to avoid. Fluids with caffeine, such as tea, coffee, should be avoided because these may act as diuretics and promote fluid loss. We're trying to avoid fluid loss. We want to keep them hydrated. Remember that caffeine, it irritates the lining of the bladder. And it acts as a diuresis, and we do not want them losing fluids. Infants who are breastfeeding should continue to breastfeed because human milk confers some degree of protection from infection. But do not force fluids. Gentle persuasion with preferred beverages is usually more successful. Don't try to force it. I see the look of concern on your faces, guys. Don't worry. Wherever we stop next week, we're going to pick up because this is very important. I don't trust you read it on your own. I need to make sure you know what you need to know. So just relax. Whatever we get through, that's what we get through, and we'll continue next week, okay?
notify the nurse or the practitioner if there is sufficient um, insufficient voiding, which means you're going to be looking at the INO, right? You're going to be looking, especially at that urine output. In the hospital, diapers are a way to assess output, which should be approximately, look at this, guys, this is what we want, one milliliter per kilogram per hour in the child that weighs less than 30 uh, kilograms. So you know how for the adult, what's the urine output we want to have minimum? 30 mLs per hour. But when we're dealing with kids, remember, we're, um, we're dealing with, it's always weight. So if they're less than 30 kilograms, we want at least one milliliter per kilogram per hour. It should be at least 30 milliliters per hour in patients weighing more than 30 kilograms. So if they weigh more than 30 kilograms, just like the adult, we want 30 mLs per hour. The practitioner should be notified if urine output is below normal range for the child's weight. Here's why. Whenever something is severely wrong with the patient, hemorrhage, severe dehydration, whatever it is, one of the first organs to always shut down is going to be the kidney. Because remember, when it comes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, priority, one of the priorities is fluid and electrolytes, right? That can kill you or keep you alive longer than a lot of other things. Those kidneys shut down to preserve the fluid and electrolytes that you have, number one, right? And help to reroute the um, oxygenated blood, all of those fluid and electrolytes to those vital organs. So it's very important that urine output will tell you a lot. Let's talk about acute viral nasal pharyngitis, a fancy term for the common cold. <laughs> fancy term for the co common cold. Please understand the common cold, acute viral nasal pharyngitis. Is this bacterial or viral? Viral. So if the practitioner orders a bacteria uh, antibiotic, are we going to just be blindly give it like a robot? No. We do not give antibiotics for viral infections, okay? If something is a virus, we can treat those symptoms, right? But it has to run its course. Acute nasal pharyngitis is the equivalent of the common cold. It's caused by a number of viruses, such as rhinoviruses, RSV, <laughs> adenovirus, influenza virus, parainfluenza virus. The symptoms are more severe in infants and children than in adults. The smaller the body, the quicker that things can go left. Therapeutic management. Antipyretics may be prescribed for fever and discomfort. We're going to give fluids and rest because remember, if they have a fever, that means the metabolic rate has increased. If the metabolic rate has increased, that means the oxygen demand has increased. Okay? Rest, fluids. I put a sad face next to over-the-counter cough suppressants. Why? Over-the-counter cough suppressants are not routinely recommended and should be prescribed with caution. Look at this. Cough is a protective way of clearing the throat. Coughing helps you get all that nasty gook mucus out. <laughs> Why would you want to suppress it and let it just sit there? and get thicker. And what happens to fluid when it doesn't move? Bacteria grows. So exactly, patient can get pneumonia. What started off as a simple cold, right? Now the patient may have a secondary bacterial infection or something more severe such as pneumonia. Products containing dextromethorphan may be prescribed for a dry hacking cough. Notice it said dry right? Dry hacking cough, especially at night. So if it's dry, we're not worried about all that mucus that they wouldn't be able to cough up. That's important. Some preparations contain 22% alcohol and can have adverse effects such as confusion, hyperexcitability, <laughs> dizziness, nausea, and sedation. So the parents have to monitor that child very closely or you the nurse if you're caring for that child. But you want to be teaching this to the parent. Over-the-counter cough and cold uh, medications do not work for children younger than six years old. And in some cases, it can be health risks. I don't know. I couldn't even tell you. I, I'm not even going to try to guess. I never even looked into it to find out. But I know it doesn't. 
don't waste your time. Antihistamines. I put a sad face next to that. Oh, when I said don't waste your time, I meant don't waste your time giving it to a six year old, not finding out why. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I put a sad face next to antihistamines. Why? Look, antihistamines are largely ineffective in treatment of nasal pharyngitis. These drugs have a weak atropine like effect that drives secretions, but they can cause drowsiness. Or paradoxically, remember when you see that word paradoxically, that means opposite, ironically, right? Paradoxically, have a stimulatory effect on children. There is no support for the usefulness of expectorants and antibiotics, and they're usually not indicated because most infections are viral. <laughs> Let's talk about prevention. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible to prevent the common cold. However, you can decrease the risk. How? Frequent hand washing, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, mouth, those mucous membranes where, you know, it's, it gets into the body. Nursing care and management. You want to elevate the head of the bed or the crib mattress to assist with drainage of secretions, also helps with breathing. Suctioning and vaporizing can help provide relief. Saline nose drops, uh, gentle suctioning with the both syringe before feeding and sleep time can be useful. Maintaining adequate fluid intake is what? Essential. Isn't, those one, isn't that one of those keywords I taught you last semester? When you see it, you better know it. It's important. You're going to see it again somewhere. Offer appropriate fluids to prevent dehydration. The fluids can be cool, such as popsicles. Avoid contact with affected persons. Make sure, and you're going to teach them to dispose of the tissues. Don't let them pile up. <laughs> Do not share towels, glasses, eating utensils. Avoid direct contact with others if possible. Cover the mouth and nose with tissues or an elbow when coughing or sneezing. Wash hands thoroughly afterwards. Children should wash their hands thoroughly or use a hand sanitizer and avoid touching their eyes, nose, and mouth. Those are entrance points for the virus or bacteria. Family support. Because upper respiratory infections are so frequent in children younger than three years old, families may need reassurance that frequent colds are a normal part of childhood. Usually by five years old, most children will have developed immunity to many viruses. We start to see, you know, how they frequently are getting sick between three and six. By the time they hit five, we really see that decrease. Acute streptococcal pharyngitis. Acute, so it happened right now immediately. Streptococcal, the streptococcus, that's the bacteria, pharyngitis. That's causing the sore throat. GABHS, that group A that we talked about, GABHS infection of the upper airway, that's your strep throat. Permanent damage can result from the sequelae, especially, you need to know this. I don't know why I didn't put the endpoints next to it, but I'll put it right now especially acute rheumatic fever. They don't talk much about this, but let me tell you what you need to know. Let me tell you why they're telling you this, just in case you get a test question, you have to understand. So patients got strep throat. It's strep. They don't get antibiotics for it. What happens is they can develop, their body can develop antibodies and cause problems later such as um, the rheumatic fever. They can have kidney um, uh, problems down the road. It is very, very important to teach those parents. If your child has a sore throat, don't be cheap and don't take them to the doctor's office because you don't want to pay that $15 or $20 copay. Why? 
because if it's, it's if it's not strep, it's just viral. Okay, we're gonna teach them, you know, to do the salt salt gargles. We're gonna teach them to um, drink warm tea with honey, right? We can teach them all types of things. But if it is strep throat, they have to get antibiotics, or down the road we can be dealing with rheumatic fever and other um, diseases. Okay, scarlet fever. Scarlet fever may also occur as a re result of a strain of the group A streptococcus. The clinical manifestations of scarlet fever include pharyngitis, <laughs> you're gonna have that sore throat, characteristic erythematic sandpaper-like rash, otherwise, what was I, otherwise scarlet fever shares the same clinical manifestations as mentioned with the GABHS and treatment and the sequelae are the same. What can happen down the road? Clinical manifestations. The onset is often abrupt. It happens immediately. It's abrupt and it's characterized by pharyngitis. The kid's going to say, you know, my throat hurts, so it's hard for me to swallow. Headache, fever, abdominal pain. The tonsils and the pharynx can be inflamed and covered with exudate, which usually appears by the second day of illness. Streptococcal infections should be suspected in children older than two years old who have pharyngitis, even if there's no exudate. What is the importance of strep being suspected? Well, we know if strep is even suspected, we have to test them for it. Because if they have it, they have to get what? Antibiotics. Pain can be relatively mild to severe enough to make swallowing difficult. Clinical manifestations usually subside in three to five days. Diagnostic evaluation. So they can do a, just a rapid testing. Your streptococcal antigen testing obtained by vigorous swabbing of both the tonsils and the posterior pharynx. When you do this, I suggest you stand to the side of the patient and not in front of them. Yeah. Trust me. And they may swap the throat. You can get a throat culture. Diagnostic test kits is possible in the office or clinic setting. Therapeutic management. If streptococcal sore throat infection is present, so you swab their throat, it's strep. Oral penicillin or other antibiotics, such as amoxicillin, are prescribed for 10 days to control the local, uh, local manifestation and maintain adequate level to eliminate any organisms that might remain to initiate rheumatic fever symptoms. The most important things to pull out of this, because I'm telling you for testing purposes, penicillin or other antibiotics such as such as amoxicillin in 10 days they're going to have to take those antibiotics for a full 10 days and you have to teach the parents even if they feel better after day four or five <laughs> make sure they take the whole thing as you guys learned last semester that penicillin the moxicillin, they kill what type of uh, bacteria? Um, gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive, thank you. I wish you guys all said it with your chest. <laughs> Come on, that was just a semester ago. Gram positive, right? Remember, gram positive above the belt. Look at this. And oral macrolide uh, uh, or Azolide, such as erythromycin or azithromycin, torithromycin, is indicated for the patients who are allergic to penicillin. Remember, if you're allergic to the penicillin, if the patient's allergic to penicillin and the doctor orders a cephalosporin, are you going to give it? Because chemically, the makeup of the um, penicillin is very close to the cephalosporin. And so they may most likely they're going to be allergic. So you're not going to take that chance. So the patient is allergic to a penicillin and the doctor orders um, the healthcare provider, because it could be a nurse practitioner here, whatever, they order a cephalosporin or vice versa, right? 
you're gonna withhold that medication and make a phone call and say, hey, did you notice they're allergic to the penicillin or the cephalosporin? You have to show the test writer that you understand that you're not gonna give it. So if they're allergic to the penicillin, we can give them a macrolide. Nursing care management. So that patient's got strep throat, what we can do, what can we do? Give them warm or cold compresses to the neck to help relieve the pain, warm saline goggles. Did I say goggles? Gargles, sorry. You guys know I have a speech impediment. I can't help it, I try. Acetaminophen can be given as ordered. Encourage intake of cool liquids, ice chips, flavored ice pops. If an antibiotic injection is required, it must be administered. Look at this, guys. Deep into a large muscle mass, such as the vastus lateralis or ventral luteal muscle. Make sure you go back to that box we went over when it comes to injections. Children are considered infectious to others at the onset of symptoms. The minute they start having those symptoms, they are contagious up to 24 hours after initiation of oral antibiotics. So they have to have been on those antibiotics for a full 24 hours before they can go back to school. So if you get a test question with mom or dad asking you, hey, I got to go to work. When can my kid go back to school after they've been on the antibiotics for a full 24 hours and not before because they're still contagious before. It's generally recommended that children not return to school or daycare until they've been taking antibiotics for a full 24 hour period. Nurses should remind the children with streptococcal throat infection and parents to this, look at this, that's important, to discard the toothbrush and replace it with a new one after that 24 hours. Why? Because they'll reinfect themselves. So after they've been on the antibiotic for a full 24 hours, get rid of the toothbrush they've been using and start using a new one. Avoid sharing towels and drinking or eating utensils. Look at this nursing alert. You need to know this. Never, ever, 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 never administer penicillin G, procaine, or penicillin G, uh, benzathine suspensions IV. They may cause embolism or toxic reaction with ensuing death in minutes. You will kill your patient. Instead, administer, administer these medications. Remember, deep, deep, deep deep into the muscle tissue to decrease a localized reaction and pain. You never give an IV. I see the look on your faces and I know you, I lost you. You guys are worried about this hurricane. We're going to stop here and we'll continue next week. Okay. All right.